Chapter 14, The Origin of Species. All right, Darwin's theory of evolution, mostly what he was looking at something called microevolution, which are small changes in a particular species that helps them adapt to their environment. He was really good at documenting this microevolution, but what he didn't really talk about or show is something called speciation, where new species evolve and can no longer breed with the old species. They, they change enough that they are an entire new species. That's called macroevolution. And if you just look at microevolution, the idea is you would have sort of the original uh, life form on Earth would just be a highly adapted version of that first life form. But what we see is many, many different life forms, not one highly adapted version of a life form. Of course, what we see out in nature isn't one highly adapted version. We see tons of variety out there, many, 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 many different species and how species evolve, something called speciation, the origin of a new species is really the focal point of evolution. Um, it really drives it, uh, it drives it at a much quicker pace when a species can no longer breed with the original uh, species. Okay, adaptive radiation uh, is when you are create when new species are being created, and it's usually occurring where there is a an ecological niche to take over, uh, whether something has gone extinct or if you're looking at newly formed islands or or whatever. If there is a niche, life will take advantage of that, and you'll get the quickest speciation when there is a niche to take over. And islands are a really great example because they kind of separate individuals, and so evolution can kind of speed up on these islands. There's no longer interbreeding from the previous species. Uh, so it allows it to kind of move at a quicker pace and easier us, for us to view. So adaptive radiation is just when you have these new niches and you get species that take over that ecological niche. Uh, the, the finches, uh, Darwin's finches are a great example of that. All right. Island chains, again, provide this great example of adapted radiation. Uh, the beaks of certain finches have evolved to take advantage of their particular niche. Whatever, whatever food they become specialized at finding, then um, the ones, of course, that have the best beak for that are the ones that survive and reproduce. So you can see a couple different varieties of finches here and again things on islands do this quicker because there's less interbreeding from the birds or whatever species you're looking at. Alright so here you go here's your example of an island chain and in this example here you have the original species A is supposedly coming from a mainland. Alright so A comes from the mainland it is now isolated from the original species and it turns into B, right? So B used to be A here. B then jumps to this island storm, however it gets there, and it evolves into C. So here it is a C. C gets pushed back over here, but C no longer will breed with B. They have become individual species. They will not breed anymore. They won't hybridize. They won't mix. They've become totally new species. Uh, so you end up with B and C here. And then you get another example of C jumping to C here. It became D, a different species. And it gets pushed back over here. So on islands, you can see many different species. Uh, in this case, it'll be B, C, and D. All right, so the simple question of what is a species is actually a bit more complicated than we might think. Uh, life tends to do a variety of things that uh, I don't know if we would necessarily predict. So you think, tend to think of the world maybe in black and white and 
this is a species and this is a separate species. Uh, but especially in plants, there's a bunch of gray areas. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. Uh, but it's useful to start to be able to name species. And Linnaeus was the first one who kind of came around and, and um, really started naming them. And he didn't have access to genetics the way we do now. Uh, so he used physical characteristics to determine what a species was. And what he's really famous for is the binomial system of naming stuff. And that's when we say homo sapien, that's the system we're talking about. A binomial, we're giving it two names, homo sapien. Uh, so he came up with that, and that whole branch of science is called taxonomy. And that is the branch concerned with naming things. When we, when we classify and we name stuff, uh, that's taxonomy. All right, so um, like I said, naming species and really figuring out what a species is can be difficult. So you have these two birds, and I think these are a, a meadowlark uh, on the left, and they look very similar, but they're two different species. So you can't tell by just looking at them. If you put them together, they don't breed and reproduce babies like you might think they would. They're, they're different species. They're both a meadowlark, but one's from the east and one's from the west. Uh, so looks can be deceiving. On the other hand, when you look at humans, there could be things on the surface that look very, very different. Skin color, hair color, eye color. Uh, but it doesn't make a genetic difference. We're still the same species. So you can't just do it from physical characteristics. All right, when we talk about the biological definition for species, the biological species concept, what we're going to say is we'll, we will consider something a species if it breeds and can produce fertile offspring so that the offspring can continue to breed and their offspring can continue to breed. That is what we're going to call a species for the most part. And so if you look at uh, like a horse and a donkey producing a mule, uh, yes, they can produce a mule, but that mule cannot then breed and produce other mules. They are infertile. So the horse and the donkey remain uh, genetically isolated from each other. They're not hybridizing. They are individual species. All right, so what helps keep one uh, species separate from another species so that they don't hybridize and become uh, a species uh, are reproductive barriers. And there can be many, 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 many different reproductive barriers from timing of when pollen is produced to uh, all kinds of, you know, uh, mating rituals that make it hard for, you know, one species to be attracted to another species. And we're going to uh, categorize these as prezygotic and postzygotic uh, barriers. So anything that's prezygotic, a zygote is the embryo, right? That's when, when we've, we've actually fertilized the egg. So anything prezygotic is going to be before mating even occurs. There's no mating. So it's going to be, you know, maybe it could be geographical. They can't reach each other. It doesn't matter. There's no mating occurring. Postzygotic is going to be kind of like the mule example, where there is mating. Uh, the the egg and the sperm meet and produce something, maybe, but it's not fertile. It can't reproduce. So there is mating occurring, but uh, those genetics don't continue. All right, prezygotic barriers. Uh, prevent mating or fertilization between species. So we're not even going to have the opportunity to, to mate. And it can be, um, they're not, some, some things are physical where like certain uh, insects, the, the sex organs are very, very specialized. Like some flies can't mate with other flies. Uh, and it just makes fertilization impossible. Um, you can have timing barriers where some pollen's released in fall and some in spring. It, it doesn't matter. We are, we are preventing sex from occurring, and therefore there's no fertilization, so it, it, it doesn't matter. These species will not cross-breed. All right, temporal isolation is what I've, I've been talking about, where sometimes you'll have 
uh, pollens released at different times. In this case, it's a skunk. Um, the one skunk uh, breeds in the fall. The western one breeds during the fall, and the eastern one breeds in winter. So even though they look similar, and who knows, maybe they would mate, I don't know. Uh, they're not going to because where they do overlap, and these species do overlap kind of in the middle, um, their, their whole breeding cycle is different. Same thing with plants, right? Seed production varies, pollen timing varies. That, that's prezygotic, and it keeps things from mating. Okay, then you have physical location, right? Uh, there's an example of the Grand Canyon, and on one side you have a squirrel, on the another side you have a different kind of squirrel. Well, so far as those squirrels are concerned, the squirrels on the other side of the Grand Canyon might as well be across the planet. They're never going to meet each other. They're not going to mate. They are reproductively isolated, and uh, therefore there's no crossbreeding here. They're not going to get across the Grand Canyon. We call this allopatric speciations, and, and anytime we talk about allopatric things, we're talking about location. So these are separated by physical location. It could be an island location, Grand Canyon separating it, a river. Obviously a small species can be separated much easy, much more easily than a large species like <clears throat> maybe a lion or birds tend to migrate. Okay, along with temporal isolation and location isolation, you have behavioral isolation. And these birds, I'm pretty sure, are the blue-footed booby. And uh, they have a very elaborate mating ritual. And if uh, another bird that looks similar to it doesn't do the ritual correctly, there is no mating. So it's called a courtship ritual, and it's quite elaborate. Um, other examples of this are firefly flashing, where the female firefly only responds to certain flashing rhythm and, and uh, number of its own species and then flashes back. So there's different courtships out there, but the basic idea is that they will keep, again, uh, these species separate because there's no hybridizing, there's no attraction between the species. You also have mechanical isolation, and that's where the female and male sex organs um, or their gametes are not compatible. And so in this picture, the example given here is the hummingbird, and its beak length is very specific to this flower. So then it gets pollen all over its head. It goes to the next flower, which will only be of the same species because its beak length is um, very specific to that species and it will pollinate the next flower, but it's not going to go to a different flower because it's too specialized. There's also an example of the flies I was saying where the sex organs are so specific that they physically can't copulate with other flies, and that, and that occurs in multiple insects, not just flies, but um, flies are an example I know of. And they just physically, the organs are very much too specific, so you have a mechanical isolation. Not only can you get mechanical isolation, you can get gametic isolation. And this is similar in that these, these um, gametes are not going to be physically compatible. So, and it doesn't even have to be the female and male copulate. It can be out in the ocean. There's examples here of... Um, sea urchins that release the sperm and the eggs out into the ocean. The fish, you know, in the ocean, a lot of actually invertebrates simply release the gametes into the ocean and just kind of hope for the best. Well, it works because the sperm and the egg of each species is only compatible with that species. And Literally, they won't bind. There's proteins and compatibility issues. They will not bind with other species. So they can all release their sperm and the egg out into the ocean, and um, they will find the correct species to fertilize. 
Okay, those the ones we were talking about previously, remember, are all prezygotic barriers. We're now going to talk about postzygotic barriers. And again, remember, this means that uh, mating has occurred. It's just not going to be successful so far as an evolutionary uh, mechanism. We are going to go ahead and possibly um, have a hybrid like a mule um, that survives, but it cannot mate. Or um, sometimes the hybrids uh, do not survive at all or they're frail. Sometimes the hybrids do something called breakdown. The first generations are fertile, um, but the second generations are not. And um, all these examples will keep the original species pure individual species. We're not going to have any crossbreeding. Okay. Uh, the hybrid sterility we're talking about, this is postzygotic. Again, here's the mule, um, where the mule cannot mate with other mules and have babies. There's also something called a polyploid plant. And what happens here is, remember, most things are diploid. So the gametes are haploid. They're diploid. They have two uh, two sets of chromosomes, but I don't know if you remember I was talking about strawberries were octoid. They they have eight, and so what happens, and that's actually a, um, that occurs by a accident in meiosis that then becomes a new species. Plants only, I've never heard of this in anything but a plant, uh, but strawberries, oats, potatoes, there's actually a whole bunch of them that are polyploid, which is kind of cool, but then they cannot breed with the original plant because you'll end up with an odd number. So if you had something that had eight, you know, and it's, it's uh, gamete had four and it tried to breed with a haploid gamete, you would end up with a weird number, an odd number. And anytime you end up with an odd number, you can't form homologous pairs during meiosis and you end up with problems. So polyploidy in plants is actually more common than you might think. The plants are genetically very interesting. All right, evolutionary trends do not mean evolution is goal-directed. And this is, like, so hard for us to really wrap around, our heads around because in so many things we'll talk about, you know, the evolution of computers or something as they get to be better and better, and we misuse that term. Evolution is simply what works best at the time. So we look at humans and we're like, wow, humans must be evolving to be super, super smart. And, you know, one day we're just going to be total brainiacs. Not necessarily. It's whatever is going to work at the time uh, and whoever reproduces, you know, with the, the greatest success. So very hard for us to think about that. But evolution does not go in one direction and um, and things could become simpler we always go oh they're becoming more complex so it seems but not necessarily and, and one example that they give here is that we look at the evolution of the horse and it seems that it, it's directional that it goes from this sort of simple thing to this great horse and you don't see all these other branches that have have died out or have that haven't worked for some reason so evolution really is simply what's going to work in what ecological niche at what particular time 